Hello everyone and welcome to a brand new video. This is Super Adventure and these are the holidays that we're in the middle of and that made me think I'd like to share a book that I received as a holiday gift about 30 years ago so it was given to me when I was a kid called the Illustrated Encyclopedia of Automobiles. My first video that I did that I uploaded a few weeks ago was on the encyclopedia of the motor car, which was something that I first looked at as a child, probably eight or nine, ten years old. This came a few years after that, but I've actually owned it for longer, and I've used it as a reference ever since. It is a little bit out of date because it was first published in 1979. I looked at the introduction before I started filming this video, and I noticed something that I thought would be really good as sort of a foundational philosophy for this channel. So I'd like to read you a little of that introduction. Over the past century, he says, the motor car industry has probably attracted more visionaries and charlatans, optimists and rogues, than any other commercial activity. Yeah, I'd say I agree with that. Today, the industry is essential to the commercial well-being of many industrialized countries. Indeed, major companies can dispose of budgets far greater than those of many perfectly healthy nations. This is even talking in 1979. But for every one of the few great motor car companies active today, hundreds of marquees have run their course. For every Henry Ford and William Morris, there has been a legion of hopefuls who have formed a company, marketed perhaps a few dozen cars, and then vanished into limbo perhaps springing up with a new factory or a new marquee name at another point in motoring history, their failures running a necessary counterpoint to the great success stories. The promise of riches has attracted men of amazingly diverse backgrounds to found motor companies, hat makers, pork butchers, mouth organ salesmen, and voting machine manufacturers are some of the less likely candidates. Out of this rich field, this book covers the most significant and entertaining marquees sold, or intended to be sold, for use on the road. Cars built specifically for racing are omitted, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that, I think, is going to be the foundational idea uh, of this channel. The interesting failures. And so, without further ado, so this book's introductory color section tells a chronological story of the history of the motor car broken up into periods, starting from the very early years with some lovely 19th century pictures and early motorized carriages. In between each one, they have these montages of different aspects, radiator grills here. Next is the period um, 1901 to 1914. This has always been my least favorite period, personally. It ends with the start of World War I. There are interesting pictures, the newspaper cartoons showing the careless motorist running people down. I gotta say, not much has changed really, just they're in a hatchback looking at a phone these days. The strange photo on the right has to do with the garb wealthy people wore for motoring in the countryside. Roads back then were unpaved, and as speeds got into the 40 mile per hour range or faster, there was a ton of dust. Women would want to keep their hair and makeup looking nice, and the men who mostly did the driving want to keep the dust out of their eyes, but this gas mask get up at the bottom looks more like something out of the trenches from the Great War. I'd rather have the dust in my eyes than wear that. Wheels. Different wheel styles. The majority are these old wagon wheels. I always found it funny how this one picture here is sideways by mistake. The modern wheel at the bottom right, I think, is uh, going to be that Fiesta. Now you could almost do an entire book on alloy rims seen today. 1915 to 1930, the age of the Model T. A Model T right there. Model T, among others. The body styles, another category you could do an entire book on about modern cars today. Here it's mostly these antiques. I don't think this is a good representation even back in 1979, but I do like the old Lotus there. And then 1946 to 1960, the classic era or post-war period, if you will. Not the best examples here. This uh, Citron is, DS is a 1970s version. 
feels a little too American and Eurocentric. Dashboards, ancient and modern. This is an area where the stylistic choices have changed, but other than the inclusion of more technology seems mostly the same functionally. And then the present day, 1961 to 1979, as far as this book goes, with the Ferrari Dino. Here's what was going on at the time. New Chrysler Sunbeam, Aston Martin V8, and the brand new Oldsmobile Omega for 1980. Yay. Section on automotive art, art of the automobile. Nothing special, but looks nice together. The evolution of mass production. The production line was invented by Henry Ford to build the Model T in greater numbers, so that's a famous picture on the right. The other method was, and still is for small makes, a workshop like this where the car is built at a stationary workstation and gradually put together. And a colorful flow diagram of the production line. I used to love this page, and I still do because it's actually very relevant if you're a project manager or deal with lean process. These kind of flow diagrams are really popular now. This process appears to be mostly the same as today, the superstructure of the car starting out as one unpainted unit, like a protective cage for the passengers, with the other pieces of the body and then the engine added throughout the process. Do they still do the pressurized water test? Then the rolling road test, then the car is brought out and parked where they have some green ones. That's cute. Developing the new car, or how to design an econo box in 1978. First you start with a one-to-one -one scale drawing, then a clear model. Prototype testing. If that's a full 55 mile per hour crash test, that performs really well for a 1978 car. Some wind tunnel testing on the right, and it mentions in the caption how computer analysis is only part of the design process. Yeah, now it's become the whole process. The global car industry. This is 1977 and 1978 figures. This is fun now just to take a look back at what the industry looked like during the Cold War. Even by the time I got this book, this was obsolete. The flags at the bottom show how each country has changed proportionally and how many cars it produced. And the biggest producer by volume is no surprise. America, we are the biggest producers in total by far, and that includes American Motors, who are still around. It says here they built 164,000 vehicles in 1978, a distant fourth place to the big three. The yellow bars are the Soviet Union. Look at the size of the bar for Fiat in Italy. Now look at Spain. This is Spain just after the end of Franco and there are four producers active there. I found that surprising. Japan has the most active producers. Beautiful chart there. Alternative power sources. Welcome to one of the big topics of the 1970s, energy. There were actually all kinds of alternatives to the piston engine, like the rotary engine and closed cycle hot air engine, which is one that I had previously not heard about. They were apparently going to use in the Pinto. I'll need to do some more research on that one. The real popular alternative, though, was electric, which was nothing new but came back in a big way in the 70s because fuel crisis and finite resources the Ford Commuta at the top was one of the examples of a test vehicle, electric vehicle. We all know now that's not nearly enough batteries, right? And solar was another one being explored until everyone realized how stupidly expensive solar panels are and that you need a huge surface area to get enough power to move anything bigger than a bicycle. But that didn't stop Ken E. Kret from driving his solar-powered car that looks like a lightly modded golf cart across the USA. In this picture, some stylish Californians are turning to watch him go past. I don't think his name should be Ken. It should be Larry. He looks like Larry from the Three Stooges. Cars of the future. So here's what econo boxes were going to look like in the future, folks, from the point of view of 1979. By the looks of it, future meant next year. They clearly weren't thinking very far ahead. What's with gullwing doors? Doesn't seem futuristic, seems kind of dumb, I'd say, not futuristic. They were invented in the 50s by Mercedes anyway. I like the design of the Alpha Dash, though. Always used to think that belonged to the Gullwing car for some reason. Then founders of the industry, and then we have the alphabetical encyclopedia from A to Z of cars. I'll start the same way as last time on the first page of the letter A. 
you can see right away this is a very different format. The large typeset letter A, the prevailing colors are tan and white. The photos are monochrome, not necessarily black and white, and each of the entries run one after the other across three columns with photographs of all different sizes and some photos without even borders collaged across the page like the AC Cobra here. This book also does something different than Giorgano's motor cars. Important makes have their own panel, which is this sort of tan color. The font is the same, but much more history is given for these companies, and their emblem is featured at the top. No two pages are exactly the same in this book, which I like. It speaks to the incredible variety and diversity of automotive history. Here in the C's we have on the left side Checker and a monochrome photo of a little known car called Chelsea, an American Chevrolet with its own panel on a whole page. Some of the famous Chevrolets are shown here, the 54 Chevy Bel Air, Corvette Stingray, 1971 Camaro, and most important of all, the brand new 1980 Citation. Man, I remember these cars. They were absolute garbage. That's the X-Car platform GM, same basic car as that Omega we saw in the color section. There was a notchback Citation too, but the liftback was not offered on the Oldsmobile. Then there's Citron here. 1919 to date. This book was printed after the Peugeot takeover of Citron. You have here a really cool picture of the legendary 2CV. In 1948, that's how it looked when it first came out. I believe this would be an aluminum body. Backward opening front doors, 450 cc. The Citron DS and the LN 1978, based on the Peugeot 104 with the 600cc AMI engine, so it's like an updated AMI 8. Then Cord. This book is very American-centric, so Cord has their own section even though they only exist for eight years. And this is in E. So here's one of those electric cars from the 70s. Back to that discussion about EVs from the Alternative Power Sources chapter. The Enfield Electric. Electric cars were suddenly popular in the 70s when the oil embargo happened and everyone freaked out that gasoline would disappear. So we gotta go electric. And most of these upstarts only lasted a few years, like the Enfield here. It says 1973 to 1976. The author doesn't have much nice to say about it. Under the dumpy fiberglass body, he says, is the 48-volt motor and some batteries. This page highlights one of the things that tended to be back in the old days of the classic car movement, was this Eurocentric or American-centric attitude. Take for example Hotchkiss, a make of car probably nobody is familiar with anymore, and which has defunct since 1954, while Honda, one of the largest manufacturers in the world, even at the time, and they don't have a special section for Honda. It's just part of the regular text here as is Hong Ki, which is still around in China making limousines for Chinese President Xi Jinping. The early Hong Ki is definitely a licensed version of a Western car, however, but I don't recognize it. If someone does whatever you see this, please comment on it. I'd like to know. We saw NSU in motor cars, so here's NSU in this book. Very similar, a special section. The NSU emblem here, and again the RO80, a 1976 version, and the last NSU from 1958 to 1977, it says. The Wankel engine killed the NSU brand for good, and it had so much promise. P is for Panard, one of the earliest automobiles and after World War II, an aluminum air-cooled light car called the Dyna. This is from a time when cars could be cute. The 1948 Dyna that evolved into the PL-17 from 1963, a lovely car. Panard is one of my favorite cars and easily my favorite French make ever. Then a couple of minor makes. The Paramount is a pretty car I've never heard of. The Panther 6-wheeler. Up top, you could see if you watch one of the videos of the Earl's Court Motor Show here on YouTube from the 1970s. Panther would park this car on a pavilion at Earl's Court and, I suppose, Take all the orders they'd get that year for this bizarre six-wheeler. What's the advantage of having six wheels? Nothing. It's just, that's a supercar. Look at me. How am I better than any other car? I have more wheels than you. Six of them. But only one windscreen wiper. 
coal of next year's Panther 6 production is sold already. Riley. What I found most disappointing about this history of Riley is that the most interesting period, the British Motors Leyland era, is just a passing sentence at the end. Representing that era is the Riley Elf, which I have a nice scale model of. On this page, Wrightcraft Scudicar. You can see the picture, there's one of the earliest true microcars. Even back in the 30s, you can see it was sort of being humorous with its design. There we have Saab, who started only after the war, first as DKW Type 2 Strokes, which is the Saab 92, and then legendary cars like the 99 Turbo here, which is now a great classic. We have Singer, 1905 to 1970, but no picture of the Singer Gazelle. I'm disappointed here again. I found this make, Siva, on the right here kind of interesting. Looks like a homemade supercar. And it was becoming popular for shed cars to start offering a Safari 4x4 too. And I sort of like that. Skoda, SS, this is Jaguar before they became Jaguar, and Standard. They have a monochrome advertisement picture of the flying Standard 9 up top and the 1957 Standard Vanguard there, which those were made until 1963, and the German Standard below that, Standard Superior that later became Gutbrod Superior. Here's Stanley, talk about an alternative power source. Steam-powered cars were once a thing. Studebaker, then the T's, Toyota, Trabant, TVR, and Triumph all on one page. But only Triumph has its own section. This continues the complaint I had with Honda. Toyota just gets a few paragraphs and one picture, not very representative of their size in the industry. I actually found a scale model of this exact Trabant, the P50. This is actually the early Trabant, the 601 that everyone knows didn't come till the mid 60s. In this book it says the body is made out of reason reinforced paper mache which is not quite. It's actually a material called duroplast that the East Germans invented if you could call it that which is reason reinforced cotton. There's a video somewhere on YouTube of the Trabant production line in Zwickau. Watch it, it's fascinating. Then after Triumph we have another important British mark Wolseley. I showed Wolseley in the Motor Cars Encyclopedia video, so here it is in this one. The most recent model, the Wolseley 6. And the models of the 1550 and the 6 in 143 scale. The text, updated to show they've gone out of business by this time in 1976, still glosses over the entire BMC Leyland period in one sentence, even though that's sales-wise probably the most prolific era for Wolseley. Now this name is also forgotten. The end of the encyclopedia is XYZ altogether. You'll notice that cool make Zunder that I highlighted in motor cars is missing. But there's the Zeta up there, which is an Australian oddball car with a two-stroke engine. It definitely catches your eye. And that's it. Well, thank you for joining me in that review of that interesting little book. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And make sure to enjoy your holiday season, and I hope to see you all again soon. Take care.